Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this morning, uh, Collection Assessment and Diversity Analysis. And my name is Charlie Taylor, and I am a continuing education consultant at KDLA, and I'm going to be facilitating the webinar today. And I'd like to welcome all of you for attending. Um, this is going to be a great webinar, very informative, uh, with a couple of great presenters. So um, let's do a little bit of housekeeping, and then we'll get started. Um, our Presenters have asked that we do questions at the end of today's webinar, so please feel free to ask them as we go so you don't forget, and I'm going to compile them, and we'll just go back through them at the end of the webinar, but um, we'll just be holding them until then. But please feel free to use that chat function to comment questions. Let me know if you have any technical issues. I'll be here to help out with those. The full PDF of today's slides is available in the Blackboard Learn course. It should still be open as a tab on your computer. Um, they'll be open until I close the course, which will probably be early next week. So I recommend getting those and downloading them. A lot of good information in these slides to keep. A reminder that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available in our online learning portal within about a week's time. And last Thing is you may have already noticed that captioning is available for this webinar. You can view the live captions inside of the webinar room or you can open them in our stream text service. I've just put that link in the chat and if you haven't found the chat yet, click that purple tab in the bottom right hand corner and it'll expand a white panel on the right side of your screen and you'll just click that chat bubble and uh, you should be able to see that there, that stream text link. But that just opens a separate window where you can view the captions. Um, some people prefer that method, so please feel free to use either one. And I believe that is everything I have, so I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, Beth Eifler and Sarah Geisler. They are librarians at the Campbell County Public Library up in Northern Kentucky. So Beth and Sarah, I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Beth Eifler. I'm the Collection Services Coordinator at the Campbell County Public Library. I'm here with Sarah Geisler, our Collection Services Librarian. Um, I'm going to begin today by discussing our overall collection assessment process, and then Sarah will talk about our first ever young adult diversity audit. So Campbell County began a formal collection assessment process in 2010 as a means of measuring the overall quality of the collection. It gives us an opportunity to take a closer look at what we have and how well it's being used. We focus on the size of our collection, the publication age, and circulation numbers. We compare the collection with library standards and with local demographic data. The collection assessment allows us to identify problem areas and it informs selection, deselection, and budgeting for the two years until the next assessment. So this is some of the methods that we use in the assessment. I'm going to talk about some of these in detail later, but this is an overview. Um, for a comparison to standards, we use the most recent available edition of the Kentucky Public Library Standards, which um, currently is still the sixth edition from 2016-2017. We look at whether we are meeting current standards for spending and for how much we add to and withdraw from the collection each year. For the gap analysis, we compare award winning, winner lists with what we have in the collection. So for example, we look to see if we own all the Newberry Award winners, the Caldecott Award winners, Pulitzer Prize, et cetera. We also list check against the ALA's recommended title and notable books list as a way to measure how complete and well-rounded our collection is as a popular materials library. For the age of the collection, we use the CREW method as a benchmark for presenting and discussing the age of the library's collection. In the use analysis, we calculate an average circulation per item. This provides a standardized method for comparing collections of different sizes at different branches. Relative use gives us the ratio of the percentage of a collection's circulation to the percentage of holdings in that particular area. 
So in other words, we look at the number of items in a section versus the numbers of CERCs in that section. For community needs, we evaluate segments of the collection that are used primarily by specific age groups. So for example, do we have enough easy readers and board books to meet the size of our population aged five and under? It's important to note that most of the methods that we use in the assessment are presented in the course Fundamentals of Collection Assessment, which is offered by the Association for Library Collections and Technical Services. Okay, so this is some of the types of data that we use. We do item counts, which are pulled through Polaris Simply Reports. We look at publication dates, which are pulled directly from bibliographic records. We look at circulation statistics. We look at formats. So in some areas of the assessment, the collection is divided into very general formats that most closely align with reporting to KDLA. Um, but in er other areas of the assessment, the collection is further divided into several small, smaller categories by the item statistical codes. Um, this allows for analysis on a more granular level when simple division by format is just too broad to be helpful. So for example, the format may be juvenile fiction, but we can dig deeper by using statistical codes and look specifically at juvenile board books or juvenile easy readers. Of course, we use census data when looking at local demographics. And some of the criteria that we use is that we measure um, and organize our data by fiscal year. So that's July 1st through June 30th. And in some sections of the assessment, we look only at available items. Um, so in other words, we're not gonna look for things that are lost, missing, withdrawn, on order, in process. We just want to look at what is actually available to our patrons and using available item statuses allows us to have the most accurate snapshot. So these are some of our data sources. Um, of, like I said before, we use Polaris ILS. So some of the information is gathered through direct bibliographic and item level searches. We use Polaris reports and notices. We also use Polaris Simply Reports. Um, this allows us to run item list reports and filter results by assigned branch, collection, material type, statistical code, and circulation status. Internal reports include monthly report statistics from the technical services manager, from collection services staff, as well as some of the data um, that the director includes in his annual report to the state. We use the reports module of Overdrive Marketplace um, to look at Kentucky Libraries Unbound. And of course, we use the United States Census Bureau for demographic information. Okay, so here is a table from the assessment showing the overall collection size at Campbell County Public Library. Um, this shows changes since the 2012 assessment and we've had a total decrease of 26% over the past 10 years. We began a formal weeding process in 2012, and that's why you'll see the most significant decrease in the size of the collection from about 2012 to 2016. Everything sort of leveled off in 2018, and then in 2020, the collection decreased more, and this is largely due to COVID not having the staff available to order and process materials, having dealing with backlogs and shipment issues, uh, all that fun stuff that led to us adding fewer things in 2020 and 2021. Okay, so this table shows the collection size narrowed down by branch and format. We see significant decreases in AV due to the continued rise in streaming use and less materials being published in physical format. So you can see there that overall, overall system-wide, our video decreased by 6%, but our audiobooks decreased by 21%, music by 23%, and video games by 15%. Um, so this is, again, it's due to the rise in 
streaming and less materials being published in physical format. Um, another thing you can see on this table is that our Alexandria branch experienced a dramatic decrease after weeding about 23% of their collection between July and December 2021. Um, our Alexandria branch is a small satellite branch. It's intended to be high turnover, very popular materials. Um, and so it doesn't have a lot of space. And after being open for three years, they did a major purge of duplicate items, grubby items, and generally items that just didn't circulate enough to warrant the space on their shelves. Okay, so this table looks at collection age. Again, it's broken down by format. Previous KDLA standards examine the collection in five-year increments, and so we continue to use that as a measure for the assessment. As a popular materials library, ideally, most of our holdings would be published within the past five years. The number of holdings should decrease as the pub publication age grows older. So in this table, we can see that about 65% of our collection was published within the past 10 years. And again, 37%, that's the highest percentage of the collection, was published within the past five years. 20% published prior to 2008 is too high and shows that we need to review some of our collections, in particular, the nonfiction. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we use the CREW method to, when looking at collection age. CREW stands for Continuous Review, Evaluation, and Weeding. It was developed by the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. And it provides guidance on how to remove outdated and no longer useful materials from a library's collection. It specifies areas of the collection where currency is more necessary as the content becomes outdated more quickly than in other areas of the collection. So for examples, for our 300s, your law, economics, crew recommends review after three years. Um, for medical and health information, it recommends review after five years. So we take a closer look in the assessment at those particular areas. We include both average and median dates. Because averages can be skewed by a handful of items at one extreme or the other, um, we, we'd like to include the median publication date as that presents a more accurate picture of what the actual age of our collection is. Um, and so I have there, based on our 2022 assessment, these would be the recommended median dates for based on the shelf life as recommended by CREW. So for a shelf life of one to three years, you're looking at an ideal median date of 2021 and so on. Okay, so this is a, a table taken directly from the assessment. Um, and it's the section where we're looking specifically at 610s. So we include um, what crew dictates for this section. As you can see there, it says, weed ruthlessly when it comes to current medical practices. Patrons rely on up-to-date information and outdated information can be dangerous. So we look at all of our 610s in the system, the adult, juvenile, and young adult. We can see how many items we have in those sections. And then we have our median and our average publication dates. And we can see that the median dates are all older than the ideal date of 2020. In this section of the assessment, we found that most collections, and especially our juvenile nonfiction collections, are outdated. Um, and a lot of this can be attributed to COVID because we were not keeping up with regular weeding during that period. Okay, so let's talk about relative use. Relative use is the ratio of the percentage of a collection circulation versus the percentage of holdings in that particular area. And I've got the equation there that you can use to determine relative use. So generally, once you run this equation, the goal should be a one-to-one -one ratio. If a collection makes up 30% of the library's holdings, ideally, it should make up 30% of circulation. If relative use is greater than one, 
it indicates that circulation is higher than holdings and we should consider increasing the size of the collection. If relative use is less than one, it indicates that circulation is lower than holdings and we should consider weeding the collection or promoting it to encourage better circulation. When the number is exactly one, that tells me that we are adequately adding to and withdrawing from the collection. So here is a relative use table from the assessment. This is looking at our Fort Thomas Branches adult nonfiction collection. Um, and it's broken down into each of the 10 major areas of Dewey nonfiction. And you can see right at the top, the adult zeros have a relative use number of 1.54. So it's a number higher than one and it indicates a need for more materials. We can also look at the percentages of the total collection and of the circulation. We see that the zeros make up 2% of Fort Thomas's adult nonfiction, but it makes up 3% of the circulation. So again, using those two things hand in hand show us that we could use more materials in that section. On the other hand, if you go down to the 300s, you see that there's a relative use number of 0.75. That's less than one and indicates a need for weeding. Also, we can see that it makes up 23% of their nonfiction collection, but only 17% of the nonfiction circulation. Okay, so a few years ago, we reorganized our easy readers by category rather than alphabetically by author last name. So we can look at our easy reader usage as a whole, but we can also sort them by shelf location in order to see how well individual categories circulate. Across all branches, dinosaurs, are by far the most popular. They have a relative use number of 2.82 at our Cold Spring branch, um, and they make up 2% of the collection, but 5% of circulation. So one thing we learned is that you just cannot have too many dinosaur books. So another, uh, just a note on relative use before I move, in, move on. We use relative use throughout the year, not just during the formal assessment process. So each month when I generate weeding lists or when I'm working on selection, I can calculate relative use for whatever section I'm working on and see where I need to add more materials and where we want to encourage weeding. Okay, so for the community needs section of the assessment, we compare specific population populations with relevant collections in our system. So we'll look at the county overall and then more specifically at the cities where our branches are located to see if we have enough materials to serve those populations. So in this particular slide, we're looking at the population of children under five and we're comparing them with our collection of board book and easy reader collections. Now, for easy readers and board books, we have to consider how these collections are used. Generally, you don't check out one at a time. You come up with a whole stack of books. So you are going to want those collections to be a bit higher than the population itself. When we go to the next slide, we can look at the relative use analysis for juvenile easy readers and board books. And again, this is just something that we can use together with, along with the population statistics and the size of the collection in order to see where we really need to add more materials or withdraw them. We can see that our Cold Spring branch is perfectly meeting the needs of their community in both board books and juvenile easy readers because they have that relative use number of one. Okay, so part of the assessment is also to look at our digital collection. Campbell County is a member of Kentucky Libraries Unbound, and I, I don't mean to ruffle any feathers with this slide, but yes, we did have the highest circulation, the highest number of new users um, in fiscal year 21-22. 
And let's see, we had 18% more checkouts than Boone County, which had the next highest level of checkouts after us. And we also gained 12% more new users than Boone. Since 2020, Kentucky Libraries Unbound has really taken off for us. Um, the total titles in the collection increased by 24%. Total copies increased by 26%. 35% of our Advantage collection are unique to CCPL. Total circulation increased by 9%. Audiobook use increased by 18%. Um, and again, a lot of this was due to aggressively filling holds during COVID and just the collection just really taking off and continuing to grow for us. Calculating cost per CERC indicates how well materials are being used as well as the return we are getting from our annual investment into the collection. So this is a very useful reference for budget allocation. Um, and again, used going back to the previous slides for Kentucky Libraries Unbound, this shows that we have the best cost per circulation um, coming out of our digital branch. So we're getting our money out of that collection. It's all our digital branch, which is Kentucky Libraries Unbound, is also our highest circulating branch um, when compared with our physical locations. So kind of some of the conclusions that we came to after the assessment that our Alexandria branch is operating as planned. Um, relative use across the board indicates that their collection could use more materials. Um, and that's exactly what we want for that small satellite, high turnover, popular materials collection. So if we had the space, the usage would be there to support growing the collection. Kentucky Libraries Unbound continues to grow. And again, that's supported by usage stats and the cost per circulation. Our Newport has a great collection. Our Newport branch, sorry, has a great collection despite low circulation. So historically for us, Newport has had the lowest circulation among our three main branches. Um, but with the assessment, we can rule out some of the reasons for that low circulation. Um, and, and Part, some of the results of the assessment were that the age is where it should be um, and we could effectively rule, in, rule out a lack of weaning as a reason um, for that low circulation. And in general, we found that our nonfiction needs review everywhere. Um, a lot of our, a lot of the collections that we looked at in the crew section were just outdated. And again, I attribute that to falling out of the routine of weeding during COVID and it just being a matter of time of catching up. All right. So I'm gonna turn this over to Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Geisler. Like Beth said, I am the collection services librarian here at Campbell County. Um, one of my main job duties is ordering selecting and ordering the uh, juvenile materials for the library. Um, and one of my other recent duties was conducting a diversity audit of our young adult fiction collection. Um, this audit was conducted in 2022. I started in June of that year with the bulk of the work, I would say between September and November. Um, for those of you who may not know, a diversity audit is an inventory of a collection that gathers concrete data to measure how much diversity that collection contains. The data that you get from an audit can be used to see what areas of the collection need to be better developed and advocated for. Um, Karen Jensen, who is a librarian and the creator of the website Teen Librarian Toolbox, which is a very good resource, um, has written that <clears throat> the goal of a diversity audit is not to hit a specific number, but to get an idea of what your collection looks like, where you may have gaps, and where internalized biases might exist. 
um, overall, the purpose of your audit should be to give you a foundation to work off of um, to help you in developing an ever more inclusive and representative collection. Um, so before I conducted the actual audit, I needed to gather some baseline data. Uh, this was needed in order to get a picture of our library service area and then this data would be used later to compare with the results of the audit. Um, I gathered um, data from both um, <clears throat> for both Campbell County and for the US as a whole um, from the 2020 census um, in order to gain, in order to obtain numbers on specific demographics and to again, get a picture of the library's service population. So here's the table that sh shows the um, demographics for both Campbell County and the country as a whole. Um, so just take a look at that. Um, I also gathered other relevant data for demographics that I wanted um, to investigate with the audit, but that were not available from the US Census. Uh, such as American adults of identifying as LGBTQ, um, Christian Americans, Jewish Americans, Muslim Americans. Um, so I have these that excuse me, I have those statistics listed here, uh, along with the sources of where I obtained this information. So as you saw in that table from a couple of slides ago, the vast majority of Campbell County's population is white at 94%. However, that does not mean that 94% of our YA fiction collection should just represent white people. Um, yeah. As Jensen wrote, you know, whatever our immediate service community may look like, our goal is to have a diverse an inclusive collection to create global citizens. Um, and I here I quote Rudine Sims Bishop, who was um, a children's literature scholar, and she wrote the 1990 landmark article, Mirrors, Windows, and Sliding Glass Doors. And in that article, she wrote, when there are enough books available that can act as both mirrors and windows for all of our children, they will see that we can celebrate both our differences and similarities because together they are what make us all human. Oh, there we go. So the scope of the audit, um, there is no set standard for what categories or demographics you have to cover in an audit. You can look at any area you want. If you want to just look at racial or ethnic demographics or LGBTQ stats, it's up to you. For our audit, we wanted to be as, as comprehensive as possible. Um, our goal was to see how representative our YA fiction was of groups that were not white or heterosexual, cisgendered, non-disabled Christian people. Um, and looking at the titles, the identities of both the authors and the protagonists of the books were examined. Um, multiple sources, including um, Jensen, uh, said it was important to look at who was represented as author and who was represented on the page. Um, I made the conscious choice not to include secondary characters in assessing diversity. I only looked at the any protagonists, um, um, point of view characters um, in doing this. Um, authors sometimes resort to token representation in their supporting, uh, excuse me, to having token representation in their supporting cast as opposed to the main character. Um, so that including those characters would skew the result into looking more diverse than they were. Um, so for the audit, I looked at 18 categories for the authors and 19 categories for the book protagonists. So these were the categories. Um, I was for 
categories and then subcategories within those four. Um, first main category is race and ethnicity, um, white only or presumed white only. Um, often, especially with older books, and there are no racial descriptors of a, a protagonist, you assume that white is the default. So that's why presumed white is there. Black African American, Asian Asian American or Pacific Islander, Hispanic or Latina. You may also see Latinx or Latino, Latina. Um, Latina is a gender neutral substitute for Latino and Latina. Um, as is Latinx. Um, Native American indigenous, uh, MENA, which is Middle Eastern, North African, and biracial or multiracial. Uh, the next category was gender and sexuality. Um, male, female, non-binary, genderqueer, gender fluid, and then sexuality, LGBTQ plus. So, Third category was religion. How many <clears throat> authors and characters were Jewish, Muslim, or other non-Christian religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. And the fourth category was physical and mental health. Uh, did the author or character have physical disabilities? Were they did they have neurodivergent? Um, do they have a condition under the neurodivergent umbrella, which includes autism spectrum disorder, dyslexia, ADHD, OCD, and Tourette syndrome? And did they have any sort of mental health um, <clears throat> um, conditions such as depression, anxiety, eating disorders, trauma, addiction, and grief? So, um, for a handful of the authors um, that I looked at, I could not find any background information as hard as I tried. So I had to add race slash ethnicity unknown to the author categories. Uh, similarly, uh, I had to add other non-white um, for protagonists whose race was not white, but otherwise ambiguous. This tended to happen with um, certain sci-fi or fantasy books where the protagonist was described as having brown skin, but they, it wouldn't get more specific than that. So I just said, okay, other non-white. And other non-human humanoid was included for protagonists who were animals or mythical creatures. Um, for example, Call of the Wild was one of the books and the protagonist is a dog, so he's non-human. However, this did not include characters who were creatures like vampires or fairies because, yes, they're mythical, you know, fantasy creatures, but they're still humanoid. So methodology. Auditing the, the entire collection was not practical. Um, it was, this pro project was pretty time consuming just doing the sample that I did. So I can't imagine how long it would have taken to do <laughs> all um, 6,800 circulating YA books. Um, so I, I did a sample size of the collection, um, which can still provide a snapshot of the state of your collection. It's still valuable data. Um, of the 6,819 circulating YA fiction books, a sample of 871 titles were randomly selected to audit. Um, so that was 10% of each of our three main branches, um, plus the entirety of our YA novels at our um, satellite branch, Alexandria. So um, once I determined how many books I was going to look at, I downloaded a data set of all of our collections YA fiction books into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, as Beth stated, we use Polaris as our ILS. So I used Simply Reports to download um, the title, the author, and the publication year of the books. And then I used a number, random number generator to 
to pick the 871 titles for the sample. I made two separate spreadsheets with the sample titles and categories. Um, and I did this for each of our four branches. So I made one spreadsheet for authors and one for protagonists. Um, information on the authors and protagonists were researched for each title. For authors, sources included the author's official websites and social media accounts. Um, this, <laughs> just a fair warning, um, when I was doing this research on the authors, especially if the, they're authors of um, older books, um, it, so you sometimes can end up with dead ends. Like I would find the author's website and hadn't been updated or it just didn't exist anymore or it turned into uh, a malware factory essentially. <laughs> so that's also important. Make sure your virus, um, antivirus uh, software is up to date. Um, because a few times I would get a warning about some websites. Anyway, <laughs> um, for protagonists, I use professional book reviews as the main source for looking up their information. Um, in recent years, I believe Kirkus was the first um, um, review journal to make the concerted effort to include um, um, the demographic, uh, information about the book's protagonists, the background, what their race, sexuality, et cetera, was. And other um, journals like School Library Journal and Booklist have since done this as well. Um, I used Novelist a lot. Um, it proved to be a very invaluable source for this project because not only did it have all these professional book reviews, it also listed the themes and subject headings for most of the titles. So that was very useful. Uh, it's also important to note that the data collected in, in this audit is only as accurate as the information that is available. Um, you know, I can only, especially when it came to authors, um, th yes, there were certain things I could see easily, such as, you know, race, um, but things like their religion or sexuality, um, sometimes they would disclose, sometimes they wouldn't. So I could only work off of what was publicly available. Um, so once I had all of my selected titles for the sample, I had them on the spreadsheet. I, um, with Mark, um, I would mark each instance of one of the audited categories. Um, yeah, excuse me, let me start over. For each instance of one of the audited categories, the title will get marked on the appropriate Excel spreadsheet. Um, so th the author or protagonist was counted for each category that they fit, regardless of the number of categories that they fit. Um, for example, there was one, one of the authors, um, author named Emery Lee is black and Latine and Asian American. So he got recorded for each of those three corresponding categories, as well as getting counted for the multiracial category. Um, once all of the data was collected, totals and percentages for each category were calculated by dividing the number of titles in the category by the number of titles in the sample. And this was done for each branch's sample data in addition to the system-wide um, sample as a whole. Um, and I made a lot of graphs. <laughs> I only, um, I'm only sharing the graphs for our system-wide um, statistics. Um, but like I said, I did these for each of our four branches. Excuse me. So you can see in our first table, um, I looked at, this is the, um, the, uh, the racial ethnic backgrounds of the author. The second table on the screen is the background, racial and ethnic background for the protagonist. And as you can see, the very ma much majority is white or presumed white only. 
Okay, next slide, I looked at, um, this is the system-wide for gender and sexuality for author and protagonist. And the vast majority of uh, both authors and main characters were female. Uh, next was religion. Um, often either, in the uh, excuse me, often the religion was either Christianity or not otherwise stated. Um, but there were some books that did state the religion um, as Jewish, Muslim, or other non-Christian. And finally, for physical and mental health, um, here's the author and then protagonist of physical and mental health conditions. So what kind of conclusions could we draw from all this? Well, our results revealed that heteronormative, able-bodied, neurotypical white women dominated our YA fiction collection. And this can be seen with both the authors and the protagonists. Um, um, I had some suggestions to make the collection more diverse. Um, the audit can be used to inform future ordering. Um, you, can see where the gaps are in representation, and you can order accordingly to increase that representation for groups. You can also do mini audits of book orders. Um, for example, if you have a cart that you're working on um, for a book order, you can do a quick audit of the representation in that, <clears throat> in that order. And we the collection. Um, we found, I found that um, the branch with the highest um, white representation in the books also had the oldest collection. Um, and that was our Newport branch, which had an average pub year of 2015, as opposed to um, our satellite branch, um, Alexandria had an average of 2016 and our other two branches, uh, Cold Spring and Fort Thomas, their average was 2017. Um, so I would recommend, uh, you know, weeding um, the collection, um, get some new titles in there. Um, So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, getting some new titles in there. The publishing industry um, does also still have a long way to go in regards to publishing more diverse books. Um, but in, many strides, um, strides have been taken um, to improve that. Um, there is still a lot of work to do. Um, but there are a lot of um, resources out there and Ad, ad, excuse me, ad, advocacy, thank you, <laughs> advocacy for groups um, that are um, working to get more diverse books out there, more diverse voices. Um, in particular, We Need Diverse Books is a very good resource and um, different um, uh, organizations are also out there. So that's what can be done. And I believe there's, what slide is after this? Oh, it's just the final slide and that's it. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Beth and Sarah. We do have several questions to address, so we'll go ahead and dig into those so we have plenty of time. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking since we just got done talking about the diversity audit, we'll start with those and then we can bounce sure. back to the collection assessment. Um, so Susan had a question, have you audited any other collections aside from YA? And I was sort of wondering the same thing, like, is that just where you decided to start? Are you planning to do other parts of the collection? Yeah, um, it's okay, but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, not yet. Uh, we would like to do other uh, areas of the collection as well. We started with YA mainly because um, if you do research into um, diversity audits, 
um, YA fiction is one of the most frequently audited. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought that made sense to start there. Perfect. Thank you. And Catherine's question was about um, the categories that you were looking at, like race and gender. So did they need to be explicitly stated in the text to qualify the protagonist, like for mental illness, yeah. religion? Uh, yes. Um, I Like I said, um, um, when recent years uh, book reviews have, um, have um, been more, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, um, more book reviews are, are telling um, tell you right in the review, the background of the character. Right. Um, and I would only, yes, I would generally only um, mark them in a certain category uh, if it was explicitly stated. I remember there was one book in particular that just said, uh, the review just said the character was biracial and I could not find what the what two races the character was. <laughs> yeah. So I I marked them in the multi the biracial multiracial category, but I didn't know what else their background was. <laughs> so I tried to be as accurate as possible in that way. Gotcha. Okay, and then Leslie just asked, how did you determine what proportion of LGBTQ books to have in the collection? Um, so I, you know, I had the data that um, I showed in the beginning, and I actually, um, I didn't put this on the slide, but we actually did have um, a bit higher, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we did have a bit higher um, LGBTQ um, um, representation than um, some of the national averages. Um, Again, it's more about, um, you know, not, it's less about hitting a specific target and more just comparing, um, like I compared it to the national data and um, just, how do I finish this? <laughs> more just um, seeing it like, okay, is this an area we want to um, build more of? Um, is this um, something our, our teens are looking for. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Leslie, if you want a little bit more information, let us know in the chat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia is asking, how do you include more books that are inclusive in areas where there is little to no representation? Right. Uh, as I, I, I sort of stated at the end there, um, the publishing industry is still um, overall not very diverse. It's gotten better in recent years, but you still kind of have to dig a bit to find things. Um, I, I listed we need diverse books as a resource. Um, we need diverse books. Um, they annually have uh, the Walter Awards, um, which awards titles um, in diverse categories and um, different um, ALA awards such as the Coretta Scott King Award and for um, um, books about um, Black and African Americans and the Pura Belpre Award for um, Hispanic and Latinos. Um, you can also look at other specialized book lists like the annual rainbow list for the LGBTQIA titles. Um, and sometimes just using um, social media with connecting with other librarians through Instagram or Twitter and um, getting ideas of titles from them mm -hmm. or blog posts. Um, so that's, and, um, but yeah, there's still a lot of work to do, especially with um, you know, not just, you know, racial and, and ethnic um, diversity, but with things like physical disabilities, that's something that often gets overlooked. Um, yeah, so you have to do some digging. Gotcha. 
Okay, and Susan um, is asking about budgeting. So how are you balancing a diverse collection needs, checkout numbers in your budget, and did you reserve budgeting money, budget money for balancing this section's diversity needs? We did not um, do anything um, different with the budget. Um, what we, hmm, not sure how to answer this. Um, because I, um, like I said at the beginning of my part of the presentation, I order juvenile fiction, um, and I actually do not select the young adult fiction, um, young adult titles. Um, we have our YA librarians at each branch who do the selection of our YA titles. Do you have anything to? <laughs> no, yeah, no, we haven't changed anything with the budget, but in terms oh. of selection cards, um, it's kind of like using an audit process when you are placing an order, kind of looking through what's in the cart and trying to have um, as much diversity as possible in the titles that you're purchasing on a regular basis. And we also, I almost forgot, we also recently adopted a collection diversity, equity, and inclusion statement into our collection development po policy. Um, we did that, I believe, as a 2021. Mm -hmm. um, just to be more mindful of that as we as we order. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And have you seen an improvement in circulation after this audit? And how frequently do you plan to do an audit like this? The audit, since we just completed it this past winter, we haven't, you know, it's still too soon to, yeah. to know. Right. Um, and also, um, next month, I will be presenting to our um, adult teen staff um, between the lower branches. I will be um, presenting the results of the audit. And um, the librarians who do do the selection um, for the YA titles will see them for the first time and they can use like i said they can use it as a foundation for ordering moving forward and and like i said we do want to do other um areas of the collection mm -hmm. um we haven't had a set schedule yet but right right yeah so yeah we don't know when we'll get back around to auditing the ya collection for a second time <laughs> right <laughs> And if we want to do juvenile fiction next or right yeah we fiction. haven't determined where to go next gotcha looking at other parts of the collection exactly gotcha all right and let me i'm going to bounce back to a different slide just so we have some context since it was back closer to the beginning um let's see it's slide seven i believe Yes. Um, so yeah, going back to the collection assessment portion of the webinar, like the, the early portion. So um, we had a question from Leslie about, um, we see adult fiction and juvenile, the adult categories and the juvenile um, categories on here, but um, were there YA statistics about collection size or percent change? Okay, yeah, so that's actually an important thing to note that depending where we pulled the information from, um, that that determines like how um, detailed it gets. So for this particular chart, YA is included with juvenile fiction. Um, and I believe that goes back to some previous KDLA um, methods of tracking. Um, we do in other areas of the assessment, I do pull out the young adult from the juvenile fiction, but in this particular chart, it includes it. Yeah, probably something to do with the annual report. <laughs> Always good to yeah. like yeah. video when you can. That's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, the next question was on slide 13, having to do with the easy reader categories. So have you found that separating the easy reader books like this uh, has improved your easy reader circulation overall? I guess kind of looking at the, diff the breakdown. Um, do you have any ideas about whether or not it's improved the circulation doing this sort of look at it? It's a little it's a little difficult to say because it, we adopted this um, the categories not too I mean maybe a year or two before the pandemic yeah. and that's 
the pandemic is going to um, skew. negatively skew the, yeah. the circulation stats. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, tru I truly don't know um, what the effect on circulation has been. Yes, the, the categories were, um, uh, um, I can't think of the verb, um, the, our children's outreach department and our um, children's staff came up with the categories and they are actually responsible for assigning the categories um, for our easies. Gotcha. And we just noticed there's no phonics titles. Is there a particular reason for that? We do have phonics as a, a shelf location um, and they are separated at the branches. Uh, we do, when we say easy readers, we're referring to picture books. Um, we have a separate uh, section for beginning readers and phonics are included with the beginning readers. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And so they're, they're not, not in oh, they're not in those, they're not put into those um, easy reader categories. Gotcha. The font beginning readers. Gotcha. Just a couple more questions. Um, <laughs> we had an observation on this slide um, that Alexandria, your Alexandria location has the highest percentage population of children under five, but the lowest use of easy readers. And we were just sort of curious, well, one of the lowest uses anyway, uh, a lower use. <laughs> uh, was there a reason for that? Or we just didn't know if you had any more, you know, insights on that? Um, let me look at the next slide. I think they were seven and a half, seven point five percent of the population, but the collection was thirteen. That that okay. So the size of the collection is because of the limited space. We really don't have room to include more than that. Gotcha. Um, and so that's why, just in general, overall Alexandria's usage is going to be really high compared to the size of the collection. Makes perfect sense. That's what kind of what we were wondering. <laughs> There you go. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Our Alexandria collection only has like a little over 5,000 materials. It's just a small storefront location. Perfect. Yeah. And then one final question to kind of, I think this kind of wraps everything up. Um, Amelia asked, uh, do you have any advice on how a smaller library with just one location could apply this weeding and assessment method? Um, sort of anything that you might recommend for a single location? Yeah. I mean, I think you can do it with um, yeah, with any size collection, um, one location. Um, I find the relative use extremely helpful um, and you could reach out to me if you want and I can um, give you some more information about that if it's not, it, it's, it can be kind of complicated. It's a lot of statistics and I've got my Excel sheet all spread, all, all set up. So all I have to do is just put in the numbers, but um, yeah, I mean, I think if you're able to use your whatever ILS you have um, to generate reports, um, looking at the number of items you have, calculating, you know, your average and your median publication dates. Um, and then again, that, that relative use number is so helpful. Um, and that will definitely give you um, insight into where you might be able to weed and where you might want to add more materials. Excellent. And Amelia, you're, you're in good company. Several of us have said, oh, math. Uh, so she might <laughs> reach out to you for help with that. Um, would it be OK if I share your emails with um, yes. with the attendees? OK, afterwards. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, but yeah. OK. Yeah. And absolutely. Can contact them. OK, we're just going to wrap things up real quick. And I need to thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services for their sponsorship of this webinar and pretty much everything we do at KDLA. <laughs> and want to thank all of our attendees for being with us today. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us at KDLA if we can be of assistance to you. And just a quick reminder that this webinar was recorded and it'll be posted up in our online learning portal probably early next week. And um, you'll be able to share that uh, with uh, other people in your libraries as needed. And I'm going to pop a link to a very short four question survey in the chat. If you wouldn't mind to take that before you leave, um, it'll also go out in the follow up email if you don't have time right now. And the PDF of today's slides is still available in Blackboard Learn. You just pop in there and download it. 
Um, and then if you've attended live with us today, you'll be getting a certificate of attendance. It'll be in your learner dashboard uh, once I close the course up and be again early next week. So thank you all for your great questions to our attendees. And thank you so much, um, Beth and Sarah, for putting this all together and telling us about your experiences and, and sharing your knowledge. So we greatly appreciate your time. Yeah, th thank you for having us. Thank you. And I will get um, contact information out when I send up the follow-up email. And that's it. I think everybody have a great weekend. Be safe. And when you're ready to exit, you can just close out the tab.